Hey guys, this is Colin Warren from the Washington State University Cougs and Space Club. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to use HSM Works to take a piece of metal and mill out a mill out the part you've designed in SOLIDWORKS or another CAD station in it. So this is the final part uh, that you're looking at here. This is the model I have of it in SOLIDWORKS. Uh, so in this video, I'm going to show you the programming I did uh, to tell the machine that env ended up milling this part out, uh, programming it to tell it what movements to make, how fast to go, et cetera, et cetera. So the tool we're using for this is called HSM Works. Uh, for most of my audience here will be students uh, watching this. Uh, this is available to you for free. Uh, you just go ahead and look around uh, for HSM Works uh, Educational Edition. You should be able to download it for free, install it in SOLIDWORKS. Uh, or if you use Inventor, you can use it in Inventor too. For whatever reason you're not finding it, email the guys at uh, Autodesk, as they're the ones who do, you, um, make Inventor. Uh, HSM Works are the ones who own that. Uh, contact them, and they should be able to point you to the right link about where to download this. So what you, once you've downloaded this, uh, you've installed it, click over to the CAM tab. You'll see a new little drill bit uh, called CAM Manager. You click on that, and now you'll be in the CAM window. So before even getting to the details about uh, what jobs to put, uh, how fast you're going, let me just give you an overview about what the machining process is. So in order to take this stock material and then turn it into this piece, you have to take a drill bit and drill out your part from the material. Uh, so if I go to my job and I hit simulate, there's an actually a really nice visual um, HSM works will give you. If I hit play, uh, you're noticing, and if I turn on the stock, so this green, the solid green part re re uh, represents our stock. If you're noticing, uh, the light green stuff shows the stock that's being removed. Uh, so if you watch the simulation, what you're doing in CAM is programming the drill bit to remove material over time uh, so you can eventually get your final part out of it. So if you're noticing, it's going here, it's cutting, kind of cutting, it'll cut out, I'm just going to speed it up, and then it'll just cut out, and eventually once it's done with the given process, you will have like a given feature cut out just by using the drill bit over and over again. Because you're using a drill bit, one thing, and this actually informs your uh, product design or even uh, the parts you design is that you can't really make uh, square edges or inside square edges because if you notice like on the edge over here if you try to take a round bit and you try to make a square edge of it, out of it you really can't um, if you want to make a really sharp corner all the best thing you can do is just get a really tiny drill bit that'll just make a corner whose radius is so small that it might as well be a, a square corner uh, but that's one thing you will want to pay attention to when designing your parts is you want to give your edges a fillet of some sort or a corner uh, as because you're working with a round drill bit. Uh, they can't quite create inside square edges super well. Uh, when you're cutting on the outside, because it can go out and it can cut out and past it, it's easy for it to make the square edges. But for inside, if it if you're, the corner you're trying to cut in it is enclosed and there's nowhere for the drill bit to go without um, I guess screwing up the feature you're trying to create, uh, you have to figure out what fillet you're comfortable with making, and that will inform uh, what drill bit you use and everything like that. Uh, but yeah, that's the basic overview of how your parts are going to get cut out. You're going to take a drill bit, go into the material, you're going to cut it out. So now you know that. How exactly, now that you have the CAM software, you know exactly kind of what's going on, how do you set up your job to create the part? So what we're going to do, I'm not going to do it completely from scratch, but I'm going to walk you through the process of how I took this part and CAMed it up so that a machine, a CNC mill machine, could understand uh, where to move the drill bit to cut it out. So the first thing I did is I defined my job. You can go up by clicking job, uh, creates a new job. I'm just going to go and edit because you'll see a similar in window. And I'll just talk through it. So you first select the model you're going to be creating. In this case, it's uh, this part right here. Uh, the stock, uh, for your initial cut, you can choose relative size box. Uh, don't worry about messing with these for for now, they will come important later. And then for your work coordinate system, this is really important depending on what machine you use. Uh, so hopefully, uh, right about now, I'll be splashing up a picture of the machine I'm using. So the machine I'm using is a Nomad 883, uh, whose coordinate system is based on the bottom left. Uh, the bottom left uh, it has the X position, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, moving, it moves left and right, so negative x is to the left, positive x is to the right, positive y is forward, negative y is back, and then the z position is based on the top of your part. 
Uh, so if you cut into the material, uh, it's that's a it's considered from the machine's perspective a negative axis. So if I'm if I let's say if I have my material here, I'm homing my bit. So I have it here. It's like okay, the x is here, zero. Y is zero. The z axis it starts from the top. Uh, and <laughs> if you anything like me, you'll make this mistake once or twice when you set the x z axis on the bottom. And what the bit will try to do when it tries to cut is it's trying to get to that z axis to start its cut. But if you do that, it's going to have to try to go through your part, and your part's too thick for it to cut the way through. So you'll end up uh, smashing your bit in and possibly breaking it. So when you define your origin, uh, again, it depends from machine to machine, but if you're a part of the Cougs and Space Club and you're using one of the carbide machines, your Z axis is defined at the top. So what that little, <laughs> I guess, long side tangent meant was that we need to, to we need to set the bottom left or the top left corner as our origin point, where the Y axis, so if I do it from your guys' perspective, the Y axis moves forward from here, so zero, this is negative Y, this is positive Y. This X axis is positive X, negative X, and Z starts here, negative Z means it cuts into the material, positive Z goes out. So, now that we know that's how our machine works, I've gone here, I had to go in, uh, clicked uh, UZ and X axis, and then now I select an edge that represents uh, the z-axis, so in this case, I selected a edge that was collinear with the z-axis, so this this little edge here. So if I select that, deselect it, and select it, you see the z-axis is up there, and for a reason, if it's pointing down, uh, like over here, you can easily reverse that by just hitting the reverse, and now it's pointing up. And now I need to select something that represents my x-axis. Uh, so if remember, the z's up, the x-axis for the Carbide 3D uh, Nomad 88 machine is to respect to you guys to the right. I need to select an edge that represents that. So if I deselect this for a second, it's like this. Uh, you notice that the red arrow points to the right. So that's the x-axis. And, and uh, a good way to remember, OK, what color cors corresponds to what axis? Um, RGB is XYZ. That's just a good uh, idiom to remember. So R is red, or R means is the x. G, green, is the y. B, blue, is the z. So now we have our X. If, if for a reason it's oriented the wrong direction, I can hit reverse. So now you notice it's oriented over here. Finally, now that I have those parts start off, set up, um, I'm going to want, it'll probably start off with your origin defined in the center. Again, because it depends on your machine. But for the Nomad, it defines, it starts from the top left corner as your zero. So I'm going to want to select my model box point. Uh, I'll get into stock box point and origin stuff later, but you want to select for your initial pass model box point, you want to go to top corner one, and that should set your origin correctly. So that's everything you need to do to get your job set up. This is just to tell the point, the cam, okay, where's your origin? Where's it the, uh, where is it being set at? Uh, if you're using a stock, what the dimensions of the stock look like? For machining, at least for the first pass, because you're creating the part itself, and then you're facing, you'll figure out what facing is later on, you're facing the back to get the, have the part fall off. Um, you don't need to worry about putting in the stock dimensions right away. You just make sure, uh, yeah, you can just start off with this one for relative size box, because once you've got your z-axis, it'll just cut out your part from the top, and then there'll still be a little bit of stock material left from the bottom, so you can flip it, face off that extra stuff, and then your part will fall out. Uh, into its final form. So that's the job tab. Now that we've done that. Uh, you can go up, so every, at least all the, I have predefined jobs here. Um, if you wanted to create a new 2D milling job, just go up here, you can select any of these. For this one, I use all 2D milling. This is really basic, really easy to start with. Uh, if you want to get into like uh, uh, CNC lathing, uh, other ones, there have other options for you. For this one, for most of our parts, uh, part of cooking space, you want to start with a 2D milling. Uh, and so for the first one, I'm going to start with the adaptive clear. So if you were to select it, go down here, adaptive clearing. I'm just going to go ahead and generate tool paths really quick uh, while I'm doing that. So when you create a new part, I'm just going to go ahead and edit because I have preset things. You're going to get this dialog, pop, dialog box pop up. You won't see all these numbers pop up because the first thing you need to do is select your tool size. Uh, again, it depends from machine to machine, uh, but because Part of Cruising Space, you have access to, I milled this part off on a Nomad 883. The biggest bit I can use is an eighth inch. So I go into my library, hope the, and then the library pops up, and then you can go in 
you can go you go into uh, inch aluminum uh, inch t t tells you what units the bit sizes are in aluminum tells you what you're drilling on uh, I will give you that just gives you feeds and speeds uh, that are preset you're not going to use if again depends on the machine machine but for the one I'm using the speed speed and, and feeds calculations don't work out right so all you're going to do here if you're probably cooking space so you're going to select eighth inch flat, you select it, you go okay, it'll be popped in here, and it'll have, it's going to have widely higher values um, because for most machines, if you're not using little router ones like these little small ones you'll see me use in a sec, uh, you can do, you can run them much faster, much harder because they're meant to take the load. Because I'm using a smaller machine, I had to experiment with some speeds and feeds, numbers that work well on it. Uh, so what you see here are numbers that have worked well for me for given features. Uh, I would say follow them pretty closely uh, because I found going faster or slower it hasn't really helped uh, too much. So uh, yeah, results may results may vary, but try to follow these numbers as closely as possible. Um, oh, actually, I, I guess maybe getting into before I even get into a whole delving into like okay, what numbers to plug in. Maybe I should explain what the hell speeds and feeds means. Uh, so speeds and feeds uh, tells the machine how fast the drill bit needs to spin, and or tells the machine how fast it needs to spin the drill bit, or the um, end mill as in the case, and how fast that end mill needs to move around. So usually, and if you're taking machining class and doing CNC milling, they have speeds and feeds calculators. We can do how fast for a given material. There's different coefficients you can plug in and everything like that. Um, because if you're, I'm making this video for Cousin Space Club, you're almost certainly going to be milling out 6061 aluminum. Uh, so these these numbers I'm about to give to you, and this one should work for you. But if you're using a different material, if you're using a different machine, if you're using different coolant, your numbers will vary. Um, be sure to check those first, uh, because again, you may be able to run it faster. Um, probably not slower, because this is about as slow as you can get. Um, but yeah, if you want to get more, I guess more out of your machine, again, do the research on your end. Uh, but for the Nomad 83, this is what I found it works. So first off, coolant. I disabled because at the current time of recording, uh, we milled them out with no coolant. It was literally just a raw bit, uh, end mill, carbide, one eight, one eighth inch. Uh, not the best practice. We just don't have the resources yet. Uh, looking over here, I probably could have sprayed some WD-40 on it, but it, it would have helped a little bit. Uh, but usually, if you have a machine, you want to have like air coolant at the minimum, uh, or if you can have water, that's what actually the bigger machines use. But in this case, I didn't have any, so I'm going to disable coolant. Next, spindle speed, 10,000. Just put that every time if you're using aluminum, especially in the cooking space. You want to keep it spin as fast as possible. That's about the max speed, uh, the Nomad 883. Uh, and in fact, I think the uh, the Shapoko runs at, although Shapoko, you can manually change it. Uh, but 10,000, the cam, you're running aluminum, put it there. And uh, these next two are calculated from the spindle speed, so you don't have to worry about those. Cutting feed rate, this is the next important one. Uh, this is another number, if you were to do traditional bigger machines, you would do your speeds and feeds calculation, find your material, you get a number and they work pretty well. For this one, this was a lot of trial and error um, for this machine. I found, uh, usually you have them in inches per minute, uh, because I'm working in metric, these are going to be in millimeters per minute, so if you want to do the conversions on your end, go for it if you're more imperial inclined. Uh, but 61 millimeters a minute when you're doing adaptive clearing jobs, on a Nomad 883, I have found works. You can hit, you can put this in number in, you can run it. Once you get your origins right, it's not going to run into anything. It will run fine. As long as your drill bit is, you know, not dull or anything, it should run fine. Like you can leave it, leave it for, it'll probably take five or eight hours. You can leave it, and it'll run fine. So 61 millimeters a minute when you're doing adaptive clear, it's a good number. I found you can run it up to 100 millimeters a minute. I've had to watch it a little bit though, because sometimes it might get a little bit too loud. I have to slow down the feed rate. If you're looking just to plug it in and run it, 61 millimeters, millimeters a minute works. Um, and the rest of these numbers should be calculated from the cutting feed rate, uh, so you should be fine. Plunge feed rate again. I think you might may allow you to change it, but I found 21. Yeah, this number about like 20, 21 millimeters a minute works well. So that's everything for the tool section. Once you have your tool set up, the nice thing is for all the other jobs, at least for this one I did, uh, I could just use the same one. Uh, I changed a little bit, I changed the feeds a little bit, but you can pretty much go through the same process for every single job you have. The next part, geometry. You have to tell the machine what you want to cut out of it using the job. So for this one, I select the edge, 
actually I'll delete and I can do the process again. Select the edge. So now it knows, oh, okay, I'm cutting out this contour. So that's that corresponds to this guy right here. I need to cut out that part. Uh, you want to keep tangent propagation on, propagate along Z, so it selects all the edges. There's some more intermediate advanced stuff I can get into uh, if need be uh, for later tutorials. Uh, but for most jobs you're doing, especially for basic features like this, keep those checked. Uh, machine cavities, I forget why I checked that on. Uh, yeah, inside, you want them inside the contours. Because if you select outside, uh, what it's going to end up doing is instead of cutting it, because you have these lines, it needs to stay that it's using as a reference. So if you say machine cavities, it's like, okay, cut on the inside. But if you say, if you uncheck it, it's going to cut on the outside. So what I'm going to end up doing is taking out these edges I have here. So you want to make sure um, that's cutting on the right side. And you can actually go simulate, see what your job's doing, so you can get a sense of what you're about to tell the machine to do. Um, yep, so that, that takes over. Geometry, again, I'm telling, okay, now that I have my tool half assets going, what am I cutting out? The next one, heights. This can become really important, especially if you if you do like what I do, your job stops halfway through, you don't cut as like, you cut like halfway through, but you need to redo it. You can mess around with this. Um, for this one, uh, retract height tells you, okay, how, from what point does the bit go to above the part that you defined as the origin? So if I say, okay, I have that part sitting on my bed, I've said, okay, retract height. It's 10 millimeters. The bit's gonna start from 10 millimeters before it does anything, uh, or clear in sight. Next, it's gonna go to retract height, which means how far go down and go, how far above the stock is gonna go before it starts doing its initial movements. So in this case, I have five millimeters. These are usually set by default in HSM works. Keep them like that. I've never found, I've ever needed to change them. The ones I do change is the top and the bottom. So what these do is it tells HSM works or your G code. What's the top? What what? At least at what uh, Z point is your process going to start, and what point is going to is it going to end? So in this case, I'm saying relative to the stock top, uh, which in this case actually because we don't have any stock top, we can say model top. Relative to the model top, the uh, adaptive clearing where the bit goes in circles is going to start at the very top. Zero millimeters. If I selected 0.2 or negative 0.2 millimeters, it starts two millimeters below the stock top. If I select 0.2 millimeters above it, it's going to start above it. Uh, so this comes back to the thing before. If let's say I'm trying to cut all the way through this, but I'm running a job and it gets halfway through it and then something breaks and I need to re rerun it, uh, I'm 0.5 millimeter negative. In this, I'm negative 0.5 millimeters down. So I can say, oh, in model from model top, start the job negative 0.5 millimeters down and it'll go halfway down. Cut again. When you're starting with the job from the beginning, start it at zero. Bottom tells where the the cutting stops. So in this case, uh, you in this case it sets it at zero. I want to stop it at 0.1 millimeters from the where I wanted the feature to happen. It'd probably help if I show the feature. So you see the certain depth uh, that it ended up cutting at. I wanted to stop at 0.1 millimeters for this job because it's what I had it end up having it do is do a roughing pass where it cuts out everything more or less, like it has like 99% of the stuff done, but does it really roughly so you don't get a nice smooth finish. And then 0.1 millimeters from the point I wanted to cut at, I say, okay, stop. And then I can go to my next job. I can say, okay, uh, to the bottom zero, I can, or for my next job, I can go, okay, from model top, I can go 0.1 is my new height, go to zero. And now from 0.1 millimeters above it to zero, it will do the finishing pass. For this one, I'm doing the initial cuts. Uh, again, I'll touch on that later. Uh, and the bottom, if you notice, it's from contour because it's the contour is uh, the point at which it's defining the where where it's stopping. If you put model top, it's going to stop 0.1 from the top of the model. It doesn't make any sense because you're already starting from zero. So make sure you also select where you're basing your reference on. In this case, it's the contour for the bottom and the model top for the top. Next thing. Hugely important because you will make this mistake, mistake a few times, especially when you're beginning out. Passes. First thing you go to, if it's not checked, click multiple depths because what you'll end up doing, uh, there's only so far the bit can go in uh, before it just can't take the loads and it'll just clog up or just stop. So what you need to do in order to cut this part out is you can't just go unless you have a big enough bit. You can't just go. Uh, in this case, I think it's almost about uh, f what is that seven millimeters in. Uh, six millimeters in with like an eighth inch bit, you can't go in and just start cutting. It doesn't, it can't handle the loads for that. So instead what you have to do 
is you go in increments. So it cuts out, goes in, in this case, 1.5 millimeters about. It goes in 1.5, okay, does the cut. Goes in another 1.5, does the cut. And does it all the way down until it hits the bottom. That's what multiple depths does. Every part, I would say pretty much every part, um, again, if, as you get better, you'll find exceptions. But when you're starting out, check on multiple depths, see how deep your bit can go. A uh, good rule of thumb for what number to set this at is you want to take your bit, bit width, in this case, it's an inch, so one eighth of an inch. Half of that is a good depth to go down. So I have an eighth inch bit. A sixteenth of an inch is the is the number I should put in here for how deep it can go. So if I, so if I put in one sixteenth inches, because that's half of one eighth of an inch. Look at that, one point five eight seven five millimeters. That's what I had it at. Uh, again, because I've run it on this part, I know it works at least for the carbide one. So that's a good rule of thumb. If you're like, okay, it's like multiple deaths. How deep should I go? Take your bit, it'll probably be in inches, take half of that, plug that into the multiple depths option. That should be good to go for how deep you should cut. Uh, another thing, when you're cutting for the direction, keep it on climb. You want to set this at climb milling as much as possible. Uh, the difference between climb milling and conventional milling is climb milling will take as big of a bite as possible out of, your, out of the, the section it's cutting. So let's say I have a little bit here, it's spinning and it's taking a little bite out of it. So you take a, as big of a chunk as possible, and over time the, the little chip will get smaller and smaller, and then it'll throw it away, and it'll do that you know, a bazillion times until your part comes out. That's climb milling. That tends to uh, that tends to not put as much of a load on your bit as put as much load on your bit. Uh, you tend to get better finishes, what have you. Uh, there's another one called conventional milling, where instead of getting the biggest bit, you start off getting a small. You get tend off take a small chip. And the chip gets bigger over time because as you take your bit, it's taking off a piece. So it takes off a small piece and gets bigger, 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 and then throws it off. Climb milling, from what I've found, tends, you'll notice the difference between the two because when, it's, when the bit's moving one direction, it'll sound nice and quiet. It's like, wow, this actually sounds like it's moving good. And then it'll go the other direction and it goes, Nyeh! and you're like, why does it sound so different? That's because of climb milling and convention milling. Because convention milling, you're taking a small bit, it's getting a bigger bit over time, and that tends to lead to a lot more chatter. Uh, unless there's a good reason for it. Uh, I haven't found one yet. You want to use climb milling. Uh, for stock to leave, I think actually that was a mistake. Actually, I don't think I needed to leave any stock. Ah, all right, well, I found a mistake. But stock to leave, if you, when you're doing roughing passes and you're trying, to, like, you're trying to hit a certain dimension, like I'm trying to design this part to like, you know, three millimeters. Um, it's gonna be, you have to, you can't just go, okay, three millimeters, it doesn't hit that automatically because of all the, because there's some loads going on the bit and the bit will move around a bit and it might accidentally cut it at like a little bit deeper, a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper and you don't actually, actually end up hitting that dimension. If you put on stock to leave a, little, leave a little bit so then on the finishing pass you can go in and then slowly, incrementally hit, go up and down to your dimension. So that's just good to leave on in general. Uh, actually, I don't think for this one necessarily need to leave it on, uh, but good practice. And then linking, this is more advanced stuff. Uh, I'll touch on a little bit because I do use this feature in some of the other parts. Uh, but usually, for most operations, you won't have to adjust anything. This just tells your part, okay, when the bit enters, where is it entering, where is it exiting, what angle is it entering and exiting, stuff like that. Are there any other pre positions I need to know about when I'm entering and exiting, what have you. Just generally good stuff to know. So that was Adaptive Clear 1. The nice thing is, when you go to other jobs, all the same tabs. So I'll just go through each one of those again really quickly, and you'll start to get into an intuition about, okay, what each of these need to be set at. So once you hit OK, it'll draw your part. Again, I've had multiple passes. Adaptive clear, because it's uh, the reason why you want, I have adaptive clear on, and you want, if as much as possible, select adaptive clear is because it puts, it's a, it's a computer algorithm optimized uh, job that reduces the load on your bit as much as possible when it's clearing out internal spots like this. So actually, I'll sh you'll see in some of the videos, it does this weird circular, pa circular pattern, as you can see here. That's because the bit's moving around, and the machine, or the cam, has optimized the drill bit's path in such a manner that it's going to reduce the load on the bit while allowing it to drill at deeper depths and just cutting away more material over time. So that's adaptive clear. Adaptive finish, again, because I want to cut out most of the spots and then leave a nice smooth finish. I put on this finishing pass. The exact same, almost the exact same settings as before. So a thousand, uh, slightly slower, slower feed rate because I want to go slow to make sure. Um, again, the bit didn't the, minimize the chances of the bit 
uh, rubbing, rubbing around, going at a slower feed rate, same uh, contour selected. Heights, this is what I did differently. So I said, instead of, if you saw the, the one before, it was from the model top, this one is from the contour top because I've gone down, I've already gone down the last job, I've gone down to 0.1 millimeters above the spot in which I wish to cut. So instead of going to, from the model top and say, okay, 0.1, because that would take this and go, oh, I need to cut here for my fishing pass. Like, no, you need to go to the contour and go 0.1 above and cut that. So I changed it from model top to contour top, starts from 0.1, and then from 0.1 down to zero, it does the finishing pass. So that's the only thing I changed there. Um, I should have had multiple decks selected on, but again, because it's going down 0.1 millimeter, that should be fine. And pretty much all, most bits, if not all bits, can take that load, so that doesn't necessarily need to be on, but uh, for simplicity's sake, multiple bits, I would, I'm gonna turn on multiple depths just in case, so it, it defines a maximum depth that can go, uh, just to show you guys this best practice. Again, no leading positions, now check it, and do its thing. And there you go, now it does its finishing pass where it hits this dimension. Perfect, so now I put in the two operations that I cut out this kind of contour middle section. Now that I've done that, I wanna cut out this little divot here. So how do I do that? Originally, there was a few jobs I'm experimenting around with, uh, but you can't necessarily, because it's too small, you can't really adapt it clear because the width of it is about as big as the eighth inch. So what I wanted the bit to do uh, was to start out from outside not touching any material because you don't want it to like dig in unless it's doing adaptive clearing, in which case it, there's algorithms that have optimized um, how the bit moves so it doesn't like jam up because you don't want to jam flat mills in. Instead, I programmed it so that the bit starts out here, comes in and cuts, pulls out, comes in, cuts again, comes in and out, pulls and cuts out again. So I put on a facing operation because that's what it's doing. It's facing the top of a little divot. We go in here, edit, same tool options. So I would set eighth inch flat, uh, 50 millimeters, I found what was pretty good. Same pledge rate, not gonna really have to worry about punching because it's just facing. Uh, and you can get, it. We'll, we'll, I'll show you a preview in a sec. Then I selected the contour, in this case it was this face. So I can deselect it. Okay, now this is where I got fancy. So, <laughs> when I, this is gonna be a little more intermediate advanced for people, but just to show you that this is an option. When I uncheck this tool orientation and I hit okay, the thing you, I'm looking at is this green spot, which tells me where the part's coming in, where the bit's coming entering in, and then the red spot, where, which tells me where the bit's coming out. The problem is, though, where you see the machine entering in, one, it's cutting, it's gonna cut into a part where, in which I don't want it to cut, because I want to keep this little tab here, so it's gonna cut off this little spot, and two, it's gonna have to drill into the part before going off and facing and then coming back out, which is a huge no-no. Uh, if you're gonna do that, you want to use adaptive clearing. Anything else from what I've found, it just, it's not a good time. If you're doing any drilling at all, you want to use a drill bit. Uh, in, the, in our case, because I'm using an end mill, you don't want to drill end mills as much as possible. So instead, I wanted to say, okay, for whatever reason, the default starts it here, cuts out. I want to orient the tool such that it starts out here, cuts in, and comes out. So there's a gap here, it moves in, and cuts out, because that's how these drill bits are supposed to be done. So what I ended up doing, this could be more intermediate and advanced, I did a tool orientation. Uh, I select the vertex, and then I, <laughs> to be honest, I kind of just mess around with the the origin orientation until I got my pattern to look like it does now. So after a bit of messing around, I went over and turned on tool orientation. Select use origin and orientation. Then I selected this vertex here. Uh, so after I hit correct, uh, check, and then I hit simulate. As you'll watch the bit, we hit simulate, and this is good to do for all your parts in general. Uh, actually, I stand corrected, check it off for a second. Red's where it enters in, green's where it enters out. If I hit simulate and run my part, you're gonna notice if I look from the side, starting from the inside, where there's already a gap because we had pre-drilled all the opening beforehand, comes in, comes out, comes in, comes out, and boom, that part got milled out. So that was a little bit more of an intermediate advanced tip where I redefined the origin. Uh, so the bit will come in, start from this side, and just be fine, defined from there. So that was the divot I uh, cut out. Uh, that was the fancy co stock contour thing. Again, I just started from the stock top, in which case it was the same as the model top. Multiple heights, multiple depths. Again, one millimeter was good in this case. You could do 1.5. I was sticked on, on the safe side. I just went for one millimeter. And yeah, so that was the divot I created. 
Now, finally, the last thing I did for this job operation, for at least cutting this part out uh, before flipping over and facing it off in the back, was to do an outside cut, because now I have the part, at least it's all the features have been cut out, but now I need to cut it out of the stock, or at least cut the edges out. So to that, use this, I did a contour. Um, usually you don't want to do contours unless it's like a last minute thing. I was hoping I could do adaptive clearing for this, uh, but because it's going in a straight line, not much I could do. So I selected contour, hit edit, uh, same uh, same speed as before, but the feed rate, this is something else I noticed from, again, you have to find, figure out your machine, figure out how it, what, how it works for yours. For me, I found out for when I'm doing a contour operation, because the bit is pretty much fully submerged in the material because it's not doing an adaptive clearing, I found a feed rate of 20 millimeters a minute was good to run at because it could just run at that, and especially when around, when around the corners is when it had some issues. If I kept it at 20 millimeters a minute, even though it's going really slow, I could leave it running overnight, and even though it may have taken forever, I could run it, and it, it would do the whole cut fine. I wouldn't have to like you know manually sit there and like, go, okay, go faster here. Okay, now go slow down. You now go faster and slow down. So 20 millimeters a minute on a carbide Nomad 883 on using aluminum 6061 with an eighth inch bit, I found works really well. Uh, again, it'll probably depend for your feed rate here, uh, what speeds you put it at. Again, depends on you have coolant. That's just what I found here that works there. Uh, for the model, I selected the four edges. Uh, I didn't do tangent propagation uh, because I wanted to be a little bit more, I wanted to use an advanced feature uh, because this, the part was like, sitting relative to you, was sitting like this, and the, there's a big opening over here. Uh, so because I didn't want the bit to dig into the material before cutting because it had been too much of a load, I wanted to start out in the open, come in, cut along here. So I had to do a little bit of uh, fadangling, that's the right word to do that. So I turned off tangent propagation, propagate along Z, and then select each edge individually. So it selects all four edges. <coughs> and I select the heights. Uh, again, from stock top, contour, I wanted to go all the way to the bottom. So these, you can choose model top. That works just as well. Passes. This was super important as well. I went for a more of a one millimeter depth because, again, for a contour, there's no adaptive clearing algorithm. Uh, going at a slightly less deep level, I felt was going to lessen the load a little bit. It might have been able to go a little bit deeper, but at least from the pass I did, this seemed to work pretty well. I'm sure there's actual machinists out there going, well, you probably could have gone deeper because there's more flutes cutting and everything. Um, but this is just what the setting I set at that worked for cutting this out. So again, some experimentation and depends on your part, but this is what I found that works for my part on, again, the machine I'm using. Uh, and then linking, this is where it got a little bit fancy. So again, this is the part relative to you. I had a gap over here that I wanted the, part, the bit to come in, drill out, and then go back out here. Uh, cause I didn't want, cause there was like material over here that if it dug in, it would hurt the bit or break the bit, hurt the bit, um, wouldn't do a good cut. So I want to start in the opening. I select this edge as the entry position so if you look at here, uh, edge number five, right over here, is being selected. So that's the entry position. So now I'm specifying, OK, when you do your cam or you're creating the decode, start the bit over here. So now we hit check, and you look at the entry and exit position. Um, oh, one other thing, too, when you're doing contours as well. Uh, when you go and you hit model, uh, if I hit check, you'll notice that my bit it's having it programmed coming from the inside of the part, which means it's going to dig into here, which you don't want it to do. To fix that, you're going to go into Edit, Reverse, for all, just select all of them, I'm going to hit, actually, yeah, hit Reverse once, check, and then make sure it starts coming from the outside, in which case, look at that, it does. So now it's not going to start the, the bit going into my part and then cutting out in the contours to so start from the outside of the part. So that's also something you want to double check. And again, uh, just in case you're worried about how what the G code's going to do to your part? Go to the simulate, just run it really quick, and see where the bit goes. So now if we go into edit, so I selected edge five as the entry. Um, one other thing, because I had like, I wanted to make sure the bit was especially clear before it came in. For the lead in, for the lead in, I went down here to the linear lead in length, and gave it, told it to say, okay, whatever position you're thinking of starting at add an extra three millimeters. That way I made especially sure that the bit when it came down was not in contact at all with the material before it started its past, its routines. So that's a little trick there. Hit okay. Uh, 
then it did that cut, and then once it was all done, so if I hit simulate, turn on show stock, if I turn off the show toolpath, I'm just gonna run it really quick. So I did that cut. So cut it out like that, and did the cut, did the little tab, so then the part ended up looking like this. So I was like, great, okay. Now my part is milled out. Uh, but now, because it's still stuck in the stock because the stock is thicker than the part, I need to now, so let's say it's a sig in here, I need to now flip it over, and now I need to face it off the back so it didn't just, once it hits this level, it pops off. So now that I have that, I'm, I said, okay, I need to create a new job with a new origin because now I'm taking my fixture and flipping it over so I can't use my old origin. So I created a new job on the back, I created it on the back, and then now uh, started putting in the necessary variables. So for here, if you notice, if we go down to the stock options, instead of doing, okay, uh, fixed size box where it just takes the part and it's like, okay, that's how big the stock is, I select a relative size box because I need to now take dimensions of how thick my material was. So first thing I need to pay attention to was how thick the material was. So I this is going to be a little bit more complicated. But in order to get the Z offset, this is not how thick the, the part is. It's how much extra material above the thickness of your part in CAD it's adding. So just to give you an example, my material was is about a quarter inch aluminum. In millimeters, that's about 13.36 millimeters. I can't just put 13.6 millimeters because that's how much of an offset there is above the part. The part itself is seven millimeters. So the offset I needed to put it put up here uh, was 13.36 minus 7, or in this case, 6.36. So I, that told this, that told Cam, okay, in addition to the thickness of his part, add 6.36 above that, and that's how much material it needs to get faced off. So that's how I chose that selection there. For the X offset, uh, that was the, that's the little trailing edge you see right here. Uh, because of how the part was mounted, there was very little, if any, stock on this side, so I said, okay, add one millimeter of stock over here, uh, so that way it just, that way when it does the facing operation, it only goes one millimeter over here before it stops and pulls up. Uh, the X offset, if you're noticing over here, this part is much thicker than this side because the part was milled slightly offset over here. So I took a measurement of the part, and this part measured up to be about, or at least the measurement of the part and then the measurement of the width of the stock. And then I noticed, okay, this part here is about 25 millimeters off-centered from the stock. So I had to add that in there so that when the bit came in and faced the stock, it didn't just stop necessarily right here because I wouldn't be sure uh, if the part had been fully faced or if there would still be a little bit of uh, a little bit of slag, if you want to call it that. Not slag, but uh, extra material stuck on because it didn't go all the way through. So I just said, okay, in addition to facing the material off, go an extra 25 millimeters over and then pull up and do your next pass. So that's all the stock minus X offset is doing. The positive right there is doing that. And then for the Y, so that's these parts right here. Uh, I did this part, these parts weren't as important because it's literally just moving in the X direction for the facing operation, but added one uh, just to, I guess, make sure uh, because the I wanted to make sure that it faced a little bit uh, off the top and the bottom of the part, so that way I can just pop it right out. Because if I didn't add any offset, uh, this I'm going to show it to you. This part would have faced off fine, but because these edges would have been faced off, it would have been kind of hard to pull out. And I might have taken a Dremel and cut it out, or some other spot to cut it. So I said, okay. In addition to facing the X this far, face a little bit more off of this edge and this edge, uh, so this part, once it's done facing, can pop right out. So <laughs> that's all that complexity about all this extra stock at add, offset adding because uh, I wanted to make sure, okay, it cuts out, faces everything off so I can just pop off this guy right here. Uh, and then again, for the work coordinate system, I selected, okay, where's my axis being defined? I selected, uh, this is how the tool, when I popped it in, and I'll sh you'll see in the videos what the um, part looks like in the machine. 
Uh, but there was more extra material on, off the left versus the right, so I said, okay, from this edge, uh, use edge one for the z-axis, edge two is the y-axis, and then I chose top corner one. So it sets it at zero, zero, so it's gonna start the facing operation from there, and it's just gonna cut uh, all the way to that zero point. So I said, okay, that's my job. And now my facing operation it was almost the exact same. Uh, make sure uh, when you're adding new jobs, uh, especially when you have two jobs going, you want to right click the job you're adding new operation to, a new operation to, or else sometimes I'll add it to the wrong Java <laughs> from what I found out. So here I went from new operation, 2D milling, face. I'll regenerate this really quick. Went to edit. From here, okay, same 1 8 inch end mill. Uh, we chose a 1,000 spindle speed, or 10,000 spindle speed RPM because again, we're cutting aluminum. Cutting free rate, uh, you can run it at about, I have 100, but I end up slowing it down to 60 millimeters. So I'm gonna change it to 60 millimeters a minute. That's what I found, actually 50 millimeters a minute. That's what I found worked. 50. <laughs> Plunge rate's okay, I uh, don't really have to worry about that. Then I just said, uh, because it's a facing operation, uh, you don't have to select the contours because what it's going to do is going to take the stock and it's just going to face it all the way down until it hits your part, uh, until it hits your part right here. Uh, so now that I have to find that, uh, this is actually stuff I had to do because it stopped halfway through. So the top uh, would be from stock top. You want to select zero. And now it's going to start from the stock top, which is your actual stock. So this, the part, the uh, or the me, the I guess the metal in which your part is sitting in, and it's going to face off the stock thickness until it gets down to your model top. And then from there, your part should be pretty much done. So you can pop it out and run with it. And again, went to multiple depths, checked on 1.5. Uh, so again, because your bit can only handle so much. I select direction as climb, again, very important. Uh, by default, it selects both ways. Uh, you want to select climb because I've noticed when it's doing facing, it tries, to take, it tries to make a circle and come back. That circle part, sometimes uh, for my machine, at least the Nomad 883, it can't handle that load. Uh, so climb in general is just a good procedure. Uh, but again, depends on your machine, machine to machine. For the Nomad 883, and for most machines now, if you choose climb, you should be safe. Uh, and then nothing fancy with the linking, so I hit OK. And then if I simulated this, I ran it, and then it just kind of went across, and it faced off at multiple depths. And then once it was done, it had cut uh, the thickness of my stock. Actually, and I'll put on stock simulation really quick. Actually, simulate that was stock. If I run it again. So now you see, okay, in my in the cam, you see this extra thick green box which represents your stock. So now it's facing off the back of it. Now it's cutting it down, cutting it down, and now it cuts it down to the thickness that your part's in. And because you already went and contoured, cut it out on the front side, when you face it off the back, as long as you clamp it on the last pass, uh, your part. Um, after its last facing pass, it will have cut all the materials such that you can just take your part, you pop it out, and you have a fully milled aluminum part uh, on the cam side. So <laughs> that long crash course was the crash course in cam. Uh, obviously a lot to take in, uh, but this is just programming the machine to get it to do what you want it to do. Uh, now that you have the cam ready, you can go into whatever machine you're using, and then you set your origin, hit, run the part, make sure the bit the uh, bit's not going to run into anything just by giving it the look over. And then it'll go through the whole operation, mill out your part, and you'll be ready and to rock and roll. Uh, so there you go. Uh, that's been a very long crash course in using HSM Works uh, to cut out, at least the program cut out a material. Uh, in this case, it's been 6061 aluminum using a carbide Nomad 883. Uh, this process should work for most of the materials uh, with other machines. Again, uh, be sure to look into speeds and feeds if you're using different uh, materials as well as different machines and then uh, look into the specs of your machines if it's bigger you'll probably be able to handle more loads uh, but if you follow this video and you get your origin set up right this is pretty much running things conservatively because the machine I'm using can't run that fast 
if you follow this video, you should be good on other machines. It may just take a while for your part to get out. Um, so yeah, there you go. Um, there's every, not everything you need to know, but good start into programming, which HSM works, uh, the G code for your uh, CNC mill G code again, just the programming it, you, the mill uses to mill your part. Uh, so, yeah. And so it's been Colin Warren. Hopefully, this has been helpful. And yeah, best of luck programming HSM works and all of your milling techniques.